Amen. Good to see you this morning. Good to be in God's house. Let's go to Psalm 90 this morning. It's the third in a little mini-series of messages regarding God's everlasting character. And I don't think I've ever done a series about His everlasting character, um, but I'm, I'm excited about it. So let's go to Psalm 90, and we'll start there as our springboard. We'll review quickly and get into new material this morning as we consider uh, God's, God's character. We began a couple weeks ago with the reality that God is eternal. And that is a, a logical conclusion. Logic demands that there is a creator. It, it has to be. Uh, there, there's no way we can have eternal matter. That, that, that is not even logical. It doesn't make sense that matter has always existed and, and that God is some kind of a, an, an invention of man's mind. That, 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 is, that is foolishness. That's why the Bible says that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. It, it is a foolish position. And why, why do people take that, make that conclusion? I believe a lot of people arrive at that conclusion for a, an emotional slash human response, usually because of a bad church or religious experience. They've been burned by religion. Sometimes people arrive at this conclusion because they've been burned by Christians. Sometimes, um, you know, I mean, here, here's the reality. Uh, there's no perfect Christian. Did anybody not know that? There, there's any, any Christian, ca catch this thought. Any Christian could be a good example and a bad example depending on the day. That, that is true of any Christian. And so we've got to recalibrate our thinking in this world to realize that if if we've had a bad experience because of religion, because of church, uh, because of a Christian, we're looking at the wrong thing. Just because bad experiences do, and they, they do exist. I mean, if I wanted to, I could draw out of my past and my upbringing, my childhood, uh, early adulthood before I got saved. I could, even since I've been saved, if I was looking at man, I could easily conclude that I don't want to believe there's a God. In fact, I met a man in uh, my neighborhood uh, when I first moved to New York in 2005. Uh, we met a man, and um, at first he just seemed very rough and gruff, and, and I was kind of intimidated by him. And I, my first thought when I saw him was, keep your children away from him because he seems like a really mean, tough man. And within two minutes, God rebuked me about my thinking. And I went and introduced myself to him, and I had a great conversation with him. And then uh, next week, maybe, I, I met him again in the neighborhood, and he was telling me how he's an atheist. He said, I don't believe there's a God. I've seen too many things, so, so many evil things in this life, so many things. How could there be a God with all the way, the way this world is going? And then he said to me, I sure wish someone could prove me wrong. I said, oh. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity. And a year and a half later, Ken got saved. And he's in heaven now. He went home to be with Christ in 2019. And I, I miss him. It's been, been four years. Uh, but I tell you what, God, God did a work in his life. But he was arriving, even though it was against what he would choose deep down, he was arriving at the conclusion there can't be a God because of just how people are and how this world is. And again, that's a wrong thing to look at. We've got to look, we've got to look at, I mean, the witness of creation, first of all. There has to be a creator, because how did the creation get here? There had to be a maker of, in fact, the, the brand name's on there, Sharp. Someone, someone made this television. It didn't just evolve. I mean, it didn't start out as, you know, uh, a, a television set with, with tubes in the back, and then, you know, slowly over time, it just evolved on its own. The, the concept of evolution is so silly. While there may be adaptation in, in, in the biological realm, which is already in the genetic code, there is no evidence, there is zero scientific evidence for evolving from one kind to another kind in the species of animals. It, it does not exist. There is no proof of that. There is evidence of adaptation. I'm completely for that. But evolution, no. It makes no sense to logical thinking. 
Logic demands there's a creator who made this. There's a creator who made that. There's a creator that made you and me. There, even, even if there was a Big Bang, who created that matter that was there to explode in the first place? Who created the space in which that matter was contained? The only logical conclusion that exists is that there is a creator. And we need to look to him. We need to look to the creator, not to man. Not to, not to church, not to um, uh, society. We've got to look to God and put everything else, clear everything else off the table. Clear everything out of your heart. And we as individuals have a responsibility to know the Creator. Remember the Creator in the days of thy youth. Know your Creator. Put everything else aside. Because one day when you die and you stand before that Creator of yours, None of those things will matter. There'll never be worthy excuses as to why you rejected him. It's not his fault. You know, if I'm, if I'm a bad testimony, if I am the reason why someone has a hard time uh, acknowledging God, well, shame on me, first of all. But ultimately, even that excuse won't fly before God. Logic, logic demands there's a creator. And we must get right with Him. That's what matters. Last week we looked into the everlasting character of God. And there are three main categories of His character. We looked at His holiness last week. Today I want to look at two more. His love and His truth. And we will examine those uh, this morning as we go forward. Let's start with a word of prayer. And we'll quickly uh, recap what we learned last week about God's Holiness, His everlasting holiness, His everlasting righteousness, and then look at some new material about His everlasting love and His everlasting truth. Father, thank You for the day. Thank You for Your great character. And I'm so thankful we can look to You and not to people. Father, we fail as, as testimonies and examples. We are, we, are, we are human. But Jesus never fails. He is the perfect example. He is the God who took on flesh the God-man. He is our perfect example. There's nothing that anyone can look to Him and say, that's not right. He was perfect. He was holy. He is love. He is truth. He is all of these things because He is God who manifested in the flesh. Father, bless our study and bless our day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We looked last week about God's character. If, if, if God is eternal, which He is because it only, it's the only logical conclusion that we can come to, that the Creator, who's not bound by space or matter or time, He is he's outside of all of that, and yet He fills all of that. Wrap your brain around that for a minute. This God, our Creator, is, has to be then from everlasting to everlasting. A, a secondary, a corollary, if you will. If, if God, there must be a creator, and that creator must be eternal. That's a, a logical deduction of reasoning that this creator has to have always have existed, and that's exactly what the Bible says. From everlasting to everlasting. Here in Psalm 90, it says, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to to everlasting, thou art God. And so there's a great conclusion that we can draw upon that, that God has always existed. And then third, a third conclusion we can then draw from just using logic and reason with the scriptures to prove it. But I say that because there are some people that don't even want to trust the word of God. We, we have a generation that does not trust God's word. And yet we'll get to that uh, Lord willing, at the end of the, the, the lesson today, uh, about God's Word also has to be eternal. Uh, another conclusion. But, but this third one, then, if God, there must be a Creator, this Creator must be eternal, and then thirdly, this character, His character, must also be eternal. And that's why the Bible says over and over, Malachi 3, 6, Psalm 102, Hebrews chapter 1, James chapter 1, how that God does not change. He cannot change. He always has been. He always will be. He is the perfection. He is perfect in all of His ways. He does not change. And there are three main categories 
of God's character that we see in the first one last week was His holiness. God is unchanging in His holiness. In fact, holiness is a beautiful thing. The world mocks holiness and the world makes fun of those who choose to live a godly life. But I'll tell you what, people who choose righteousness have a joyful life and a peaceful life. Whereas opposed to those who choose a life of sin and choose to go contrary to the God of holiness, they have a life of consequences, misery, and they're just not content. They're not satisfied within their heart of hearts and that they know uh, right well. In, in, ever, in Isaiah 9, we read about Christ's kingdom as an everlasting kingdom and He'll bring an everlasting righteousness. Daniel 9 mentioned that. And because God is holy, He is also righteous, He is just, He is the just judge, and this will be forever. And God calls us in salvation. He calls us to leave a life of sinfulness, to enter a life of righteousness. If you have been following along with me in, in the morning uh, manna chats, uh, you know, Romans 6, that's what it, the whole chapter is about that. Being made free from sin. Ye became servants of righteousness. And I tell you what, the night I got saved, uh, I was 20 years old, and the night I got saved, I was so ready to be done with my life of sin. I was tired of it. Tired of the emptiness, tired of the consequences, tired of just, just the uh, that comes with a path and a life of sin. And I wanted Christ and His righteousness. I was ready to be done. And God set me free. I was a slave to my own sin, to my own flesh, to, the, to the, the, the pleasing of the world, the gratifying of the lust. I was a slave to that. Always had to have, to have some of that, like an addiction. I was tired of my addiction, and I wanted Christ. And since then, He has given me liberty and freedom to do what's right. And all that preceded by this desire to do right. You see, before I was saved, I didn't have a desire to do right. I knew what I was supposed to do right because that's what either the Bible says or at least back then half the culture said. Now we don't have much of the culture saying anything that's right. And so I wanted to, uh, even though I knew it was right, I still wanted to, you know, uh, enjoy what everyone else enjoys. But it's like candy. Sin is like candy where it tastes great and you crave it and you want it, and then you get the bellyache, especially if you have candy on an empty stomach. You ever experienced that? And at some point, at some point, and I know I'm going to get in trouble with somebody, but at some point you wise up and say, who wants candy? It's, it, it's, it, it, does nothing, it does nothing to you. It does nothing for you except rot your teeth out and give you a bellyache and, and destroy you from within. Oh, boy, I'm getting in trouble now, right? Preacher, you better get back to preaching. Leave that candy stuff alone. I mean, honestly, you think about it, sugar is a great illustration of sin. Where we crave it, we want it, it tastes good at first, and then what does it do? Well, I'll let you get on YouTube and figure out what sugar will do to your body. Healthy, a healthy body does not want sugar. Anyway. I'll move on. Amen. I love Acts. I love Acts chapter three, where it says, "If, if God, if you want God to bless your life, listen to Acts three. Acts three and verse twenty-six. It says this: Unto you first, God, having raised up His Son Jesus, sent Him to bless you, in turning away every one of you." from his iniquities. You want a blessed life? Let God turn you from your sin, from your iniquities. He is a holy God. Our, our creator knows what's best for us. And it's for us to be like him. He's separate from sin. He says in 1 Peter chapter 1, Be ye holy, for I am holy. It's not because God is trying to restrict you and keep you from enjoying this, this world God is trying to keep you on a life of peace and blessing and joy. He wants to bless your life, but cannot do so with sin. Oh, the world will bless you. 
The world will make you feel good. The world will encourage you. And the world will, will lift you up. But one day the, the, the sugar high will be over at some point. And it will leave you lower than you ever were before you began that path. That's what sin does. It, it, it lifts you up. Like let's say you're, you're here at level zero. You know, oh, I just I don't feel great in life. I just need something to make me feel good. And so there's some sin out there the devil has for you. And it takes you up to a one then drops you to negative one. Oh, I need to feel good again. And so you get that sin and, oh, I mean, you can make it up to one again, but now it's negative two. And then you're up to a zero, negative three. And it's, it's just downward from there. And just the time when you realize you don't want it anymore, you're addicted to it. All addictions start out that way. All sin is that way as well. We get addicted to it. We, we, we need that fix. I'm so thankful that God sets us free. God's a holy God. He calls us to holiness because He is holy. And He's been holy from everlasting past. He'll be holy through everlasting future. He's always holy. Now watch this. Go to Jeremiah chapter 31. Not only is God a, an everlasting God of holiness, He's also an everlasting God of love. And I'll tell you what, when, when we are under conviction from the Spirit of God, when we are in a place where we are just tired of the guilt, of the conviction, we're tired, we're tired of the consequences of sin, when we're ready to halt, when we're ready to be done, that is when God's everlasting love will be the most amazing, appealing, attractive, and desirous thing you've ever seen in your life. Do you remember when you realized that not only is he a God of holiness, and he, he has every right to judge my soul in hell. That, see, see, for me, it was, this was a short-lived window of time. From the time I knew I was lost to the time I got saved was about six hours. Because I said, why, why, why would I want to stay lost? If I, if I know I'm lost, I don't want to stay in that condition. That makes no sense to me. I mean, I'm like, wait, whoa, whoa, I'm a lost man. I deserve God's judgment. I deserve hell. I remember walking back from the student union to, the, to my dormitory for the first time in my life, knowing I'm lost, condemned before God, and looking for every car, because if I get hit, I'm going to hell. And God would be just to send me there because of who I am and what I've chosen in life, my sin. But I didn't want to stay there. I didn't want to stay in a lost condition. I, I want this salvation that God offers. And when God, when God brought me to that place of repentance, it's His love, His mercy that comes from His love, His grace that comes from His love, His long-suffering, His kindness, all of these things became the most attractive thing to me. I don't want me. I don't want this world of sin. I don't want sin anymore. I want Jesus Christ. That's what I need. He is what I need. And I love this Statement here in Jeremiah 31, verse 3 says, The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Wow, what a verse. Take that home and chew on that one all week long. I have been for about two weeks. When I was studying this two weeks ago, and I just did a word search for everlasting and came on to this verse. And I'm like, oh, wow, what a precious verse. Now, I've read it before. It already been underlined in my Bible, but you know how it is. Sometimes you, you forget, right? Am I, or am I the only one that forgets? <laughs> and so here is, here is God saying, I have loved thee, not just with a love, but with an everlasting love. Love. Why? Because that's his character. From eternity past to eternity future, his love is everlasting. That's who he is. Just as God is everlasting in his holiness and righteous, he is everlasting in his love. In fact, over, over in uh, 1 John chapter number 4, and by the way, what has God used to draw sinners to himself? He uses two things. He uses his holiness and he uses his love, actually three things, and he uses his truth. And those are the three things that his character is comprised of. And so what does God draw us to himself with? Him, his character. By the way, in, on, a, on a human level, 
what, 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 what is it that will attract us to have good relationships as humans? It's going to be our character. It's not going to be money. It's not going to be uh, what we possess. You will have good relationships in life when people are drawn to you by your character. And, and likewise, you to them. It is who we are on the inside, not what we have. If you want fake friends in life, they'll be interested in what you have. And just as soon as you don't have anymore, they don't need you anymore. That, that's fake friendship. But real friendship, real relationships are based upon the character of the person. And when we realize God's character, we will be attracted to His character. His, his holiness is everlasting. His love is everlasting. Here in, in 1 John chapter 4, John, and, and interesting that John would write this, because John, in, in the Gospel of John, keeps referring to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. There, there is one disciple that I think, it, I can't even say that John loved Jesus, like he, was, he loved him more than anybody, I might even say that. But I'll tell you, there is one disciple <clears throat> that seemed to really just bask and enjoy and is just amazed and awed by the fact that God loves him. That's John. John, John, just the disciple whom Jesus, he wouldn't even call himself by name, but he said, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Hi, what's your name? I'm the disciple whom Jesus loved. What, what, a, what, a, what a great identifying name to give yourself. What a, what a, what a great way. You know, we, we all have sometimes identity crisis. And the world has been making a lot of that recently, your identity and who you are. And if we're not careful, that's what Jesus warns about in, in 1 John 5, about having the, the pride of life. And sometimes we're too concerned about who we are in this world, or we ought to be concerned about who we are in our relationship with God. That, that ought to be a higher priority in our hearts and minds. Where is my identity? Who, who are you? Uh, I'm a child of God. I'm not perfect. I'm not, I'm not holier than thou. I'm not anything great. I just know this. God saved me. I'm a child of God. And at the end of life, that's all that's going to matter. That, that when I stand before God one day, all that will matter is whether I'm his child or not. The most important thing. And it says here in 1 John chapter 4, regarding God, he says in verse 8, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. He doesn't just possess everlasting love. He is love. Verse 16, same thing. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. And so uh, one thing we know, and uh, 1 John 4 talked about this throughout the chapter, is that those who know God will also be influenced and affected by his love, and that ought to radiate out to others. Will we be perfect in that radiation of love? No, we won't be. But it ought to be our desire. It ought, it ought to be a hallmark of Christianity that we love people. Should we love holiness? Yes. Should we love his love? Yes. Should we love truth? Yes. We should love all of God's character perfectly balanced together. In Isaiah chapter 9, so we know that God is love. He is everlasting in His love. And Isaiah 9, in referring to Christ and His future kingdom, makes this statement about Jesus Christ that I find very fascinating. It ties it together. It says in verse, uh, verse 6 of Isaiah 9, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon His shoulder. And His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. What's the next one? The Everlasting Father the Prince of Peace. This is Jesus, very clearly. Isaiah 9, 6 is a prophecy concerning Jesus Christ, and Jesus is called the Everlasting Father. Why is He called the Father? Because Jesus, God the Son, and God the Father are one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, these three are one. John points that out, and throughout the Scriptures we see that as well. And so we find, we find that Jesus is called the Everlasting Father, but a Father is there too as a a, a picture and a reality of love. And even if, even if a human father fails us, there's an everlasting father that cannot fail and will not fail 
and he's the one that we ought to be turning to. He's the one we ought to be looking to. Looking to him, he's holy. He is love. He is a God of love. And he has love from everlasting past to everlasting future because that is his character. God proved his love for us, by the way, in Romans 5, 8, when he sent Jesus to die in our place. The cross, the cross proves his love. Now go to Psalm 100. From, from God's character of love flows other attributes. Again, there, there are three main categories, if you will, three main attributes upon which other attributes of God can be hung, which they can be kind of categorized, if you will. And so in my mind, if it helps me with a flowchart idea, there, there's God is holy. From His holiness comes righteousness, doing what is right. From righteousness comes judge, justice and, and, and then ultimately His wrath, justice and judgment, and then the carrying out of that is His wrath. And all of those things stem from the fact that He is holy. And we come over here and we have that God is love. And from His love are other attributes. And the first one I think of about, and the very first one, because again, on the heels of realizing that God is a God of holiness, I secondly realize He's a God of love. And that's when His mercy becomes so sweet and amazing. When we know that we are guilty, and condemned before His holiness. That's when His mercy becomes very sweet, very needful. His mercy becomes something we cry out for. It says in Psalm 100, in verse number 1, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. And how is that possible? How is verse 1 and 2 impossible? Well, Continue on. Verse 3, Know ye that the Lord, He is God. Jehovah is the ruler. He is the Almighty. It is He that hath made us. There's the creation. And not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. And so we've got to get that right. If you want to make a joyful noise to God, if you want to serve Him with gladness, it's got to start with me understanding that Jehovah God is the Creator. He made me. I am His person. I need to be one of his sheep in salvation. Therefore, verse 4, enter into his courts with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. You know, we want, to, we want God to bless us. We ought to be blessing God. To bless means to make happy. And people want God to bless them in their sin. No, we saw in Acts 3.26, if you want God to bless you, let him turn you from your sin. And then bless God. Make him happy. How do I make God happy? Obey Him, trust Him, love Him, worship Him. Those are things that will make Him happy. Enter into His courts with thanksgiving. Bless His name. Verse 5, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and His truth endureth to all generations. Wow, verse 5 is a powerful verse. God is good. There's another, we'll get to that in a moment. God is good. He's been good from everlasting past. He'll be good to everlasting future. We see here that His mercy is everlasting. From everlasting past to everlasting future, He is a God of mercy. What is mercy? Not getting what we deserve. What do we deserve? We deserve Because God is holy, because He is righteous, because He is just, because He is a God of wrath, which is just the carrying out of His holiness. Just as a parent, when the child disobeys, carries out for their good. Amen? When God is a God of wrath, it is for our good. Because He's loving. You say, well, how, how, how could that be? Because God wants you right with Him. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to have all that He offers you. He wants you to have all of Him and not pick and choose what side of God you want to think about. It's all. And so God, God is all of these things, and God is a God of love, and that's when His mercy, I deserve this, but that's when His mercy becomes the most amazing thing. You mean there's a God that deserves, I deserve that, that God to judge me? I deserve for my Creator to judge me in hell? I deserve that, but He offers mercy? 
Wow, that's a dream come true. Is it possible? Yeah, it's possible. And his everlasting is from, his mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. Just like it says in verse 5, so is his truth. Why? Because God is truth. And so truth is eternal. His mercy is eternal because his love is eternal. Look at Psalm 57. Psalm 57 teaches the same thing. In verse number 10, it says, For thy mercy is great unto the heavens. And, you know, think about it way back when. I mean, reaching to the heavens, and even today, they don't even know where the heavens, the, the universe ends. God's mercy is greater. Thy truth is unto the clouds. You, you, you know, it's, it, you know, again, today, maybe we, we, we can define where clouds end. Thankfully, his mercy goes beyond the heavens as well. Just, just in case you, you, you're smart enough today to know that we can measure clouds. You know, that's 5,000 feet. That's 10,000. Some of those upper ones get up to 60,000 feet. You know, there, 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 are, there are some clouds that go way up. I think it's that high. I forget. Anyway, at least 20. Um, they go up there. But God's mercy is far beyond. Look at, look at uh, Psalm 104, I believe it is. We were looking at this verse the other day, actually 103. Psalm 103, verse 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. And I'm so glad I don't believe in the flat earth because there would be an end to the east and the west. <laughs> and when it says, as far as the east from the west, it's saying there is no end. You cannot define east from west. You can define north from south. There's a north pole and a south pole. And if God only removed my sins as far as uh, Alaska to, uh, you know, Antarctica, I'd be in trouble. But it's as far as the east is from the west. There, there, is, there is no limit to his mercy in which he promises us and provides for us. In Psalm 108, in verse number 4, Psalm 108, verse 4 says, Thy mercy is great above the heavens, and thy truth reach. Oh, we read that one already. Um, and look, look at um, Deuteronomy now. Akin to mercy is graciousness. And graciousness is different, but it's related in the sense that God is a, a God of grace. Mercy is not getting what we deserve, and grace is getting something we don't deserve. We deserve judgment. We don't deserve favor. We don't, we don't deserve God's enabling. We don't deserve God's goodness in our lives. We've done nothing to earn it. We've earned the opposite. The wages of sin is death. But God is so amazing. God's love is so everlasting that He also provides everlasting grace. In Deuteronomy 33, look at verse 27. Deuteronomy 33, verse 27. The eternal God is thy refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms and he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee and shall say, destroy them. And I tell you, that, that verse is amazing to me. The eternal God is thy refuge. That's about grace. Refuge is a place of grace where God will divinely enable and divinely equip and protect. He is a God of grace and his everlasting arms. Talk about a picture of an everlasting father holding that child in his arms. Because he's gracious. To the child. His everlasting arms are there to lift up and to support and encourage and protect and nourish and, and cherish. Because God is everlasting in His grace. Look at Exodus 34. How about the fact that God is everlasting in that He's long suffering? His long suffering spirit. He, he is an everlasting love, and because of His everlasting love, He is long suffering. You say, well, what happens when, when someone gets judged? Well, God, God has been long-suffering with them all the way through, but at some point, He's also a God of holiness and justice, and that comes into play as well, which is why we can't play games with God. We better get right with God while we can. Seek ye the Lord while He may be found. Call ye upon Him while He is near. Let the wicked forsake His way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. I mean, we, we better get right while we can. 
I, I couldn't. I remember, like I said before, knowing that I was lost, I just couldn't imagine going two, three, five days a week. I couldn't imagine playing that game of risk with my own soul by saying, oh, no, I'll worry about it next week. I'll worry about it then. Well, this thing and that thing. Again, clear the table. I had a lot of homework that night. I didn't care. Who cares about the, the exam that's coming the next day? Who cares about the homework that's due the next day? I need to be saved. Nothing mattered to me. I don't understand why people go on and on. Yeah, right, with God. Exodus 34, in verse number 6, God revealing to Moses his, his great character. And he says this about himself. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious. You know what God wants you to know about his character? He's merciful, he's gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth. Why? Because all these things are from everlasting to everlasting. He is infinite in all of his attributes. They're, they're completely full. They're, they, they, they're all that we need. Psalm 86, uh, verse 15, teaches the same thing, how God is a God of long-suffering, and He's abundant in His long-suffering character. In Psalm 86, and verse 15, But Thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion. I mean, full. I mean, there's a, a, a full, like full, infinitely full of compassion, and gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous, and mercy and truth. I wonder where the psalmist got that information. It was a prayer of David. Could it be that David read Exodus? Probably. Sounds, sounds familiar, right? Sounds like we just read that over there in Exodus 34. Sounds to me like David knew his Bible. You ever stop and think about that? I think it's cool. That David, David would have, we're reading, you know, I don't know how many books David had in his life, probably at least the first five. And we get to read the same books that David read. And we can, we can have, catch this thought, we can have a close walk with God and even know about Christ, even from the first five books. And it's kind of, those are some of the books we kind of ignore. But they're the foundation for the rest. I encourage you, Christian, study the first five books. Read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, that would be a little more challenging. Numbers, Deuteronomy, the second telling. Tremendous. I love the first five books. In fact, maybe we'll go there next year in studying one of them. We'll see how the Lord, the Lord's been kind of impressing me with that. We'll, we'll see how that goes. Look at um, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 is another one of God's characteristics and attributes that, that come out and this one plays into our everyday lives. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. You know, God is a God of goodness. We won't take the time to establish all that, but we can look at Psalm 107, where it talks about, uh, the, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. And it talks about in the first verse and second verse that, that God is good. Maybe we'll go there in just a minute. Anyway, but we see here, we know that God is good. And, and because God is good, that means from everlasting past to everlasting future, He is good. God is good always. He's always good. He's always only good. God, catch, capture this. God cannot be bad. It's not possible. Oh, well, this, this bad thing happened in my life. Did God do it? Well, he allowed it. Okay, well, he may allow it. And if he allows it, Romans 8 comes into play. If he allows bad things in your life, God has a plan to use it for good. That's how good he is. That's how infinite he is in his wisdom and his understanding. That's how infinite he is with his holiness and love that even when bad things happen, God can use them for good Allow him to do that. Job, Job could have gotten bitter in life. Could have. Say, well, why did God do that to Job? God didn't do it to Job. God allowed Satan to do it, but God didn't do it. Well, why did, that wasn't very nice of God to allow Satan to do that to Job. God 
is teaching Job, Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good. You say, well, what good came from Job's life? Read chapter 42. Now, you read the first 41, and you're like, wow. But you've got to read the last chapter. And remember this, child of God, last chapter's not written yet. Amen? We, we all go through tough things. We all go through things that are less than ideal. We all go through trials and tests and sometimes uh, blatant attacks. Last chapter's not written. And if you want to read ahead, you can. It gets real good. God is good. All things work together for good to them that love God. Because God is good. All things. He's always only good. That is his character. Look at Psalm 107. We were just reading this last night. What a great, what a great psalm. Psalm 107 verse 1 says, Go give thanks unto the Lord. Why? For he is good. You know, we've got Thanksgiving this week, right? You want to have something to be thankful for? Just start meditating on who God is. Starting with the fact that he is good. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. That alone ought to cause us to give thanks. And look what it, look what it says. For his mercy, what? Endureth forever. Why? That's his character. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he hath redeemed from the hand of his enemy. And then throughout this, about five different times in which, oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness. Verse 8, verse 15, verse 21, uh, verse 31. And you get down to the end of verse 43. It says, Whoso is wise and will observe these things, even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. We give thanks unto God. We get meditating upon his character. And we're going to just be blown away by the fact that God is filled with loving kindness. That is his character. He is good. Look at Isaiah. We have three more quickly and we'll be done. Isaiah 51. Because God is a God of love, He is merciful, He is gracious, He's long suffering, He is good. He's also a God of joy. One of the fruits of the Spirit is love and then joy because that's who God is. And when we get saved, God's Spirit moves in and that's who ministers that. Love to us, he ministers that joy to us, he ministers that peace, and on down through the fruits of the Spirit. In Isaiah chapter 51, in verse number 11, it says this about God's character. He says, Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return, Isaiah 51, 11, and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. One thing we know, God is eternally joy. That's who He is. And when we become God's child, we enter into a place where the Spirit of God can minister that joy to us. And one thing we know, especially when we leave this world, there will be everlasting joy, but there is no reason why we can't have that each and every day now. No reason. If we are walking with God and we're filled with the Spirit of God, we can have joy every day, no matter what the world throws our way. Now, I'll tell you what. I haven't arrived at the place yet where I've, I, I'm in that state. I'll, I'll just be honest with you. But that's part of my growth. That's part of what God is doing in my heart to teach me to have joy from who He is. Not, not from circumstances, because that's how we are as humans, right? Usually our joy, quote unquote, which sometimes we confuse with happiness. Sometimes our, our, we, we think we, we have joy because Things are well on a temporal plane. But that's not really even the source of joy. The source of joy is vertical. When everything's right between me and God is when there's joy. It's also joyful to have everything right between me and, and people. But just because I have food in my belly, that's not joy. That's happiness. Happiness is, is based upon temporal things. If I have money in a bank account, that may give me happiness, but that's not joy. I'm, I may have a good time in an amusement park. That's not joy. That might be happiness because then as soon as it's over, it goes away. But joy, joy is not dependent upon circumstances. It's dependent upon God. Look at Isaiah 54. Here's, a, here's, a, here's a, one more. Kindness. God is a God of kindness. Everlasting kindness 
54 verse 8 says, In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. An everlasting kindness. God was kind in the beginning. He'll be kind in the end. Everything in between and beyond. An everlasting kindness. One more, last one, faithfulness. Psalm 119. Because God does not change, because His character is always the same, because He is holy, because He is love, because He is merciful, gracious, long-suffering, good, joy, kindness, He is also a God of faithfulness. Psalm 119, in verse number 90, it says here, Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. God is merciful. God is faithful. He, who He was in the beginning, He'll be in the end. And because, because He never changes, that is what we are amazed by and awed by. He never changes, therefore I can trust Him. Who God was yesteryear is who God will be in the future. He does not change. He's always the same. He, if He was love then, He'll be love in the future. If He was merciful in the past, He'll be merciful. He, his grace, His long-suffering, His goodness, His joy, His kindness, it does not change. Even look, look at this last verse, and we'll close here. Look at God's faithfulness in Jeremiah's life as written in Lamentations. Lamentation is written when the city of Jerusalem was destroyed. Jeremiah is the weeping prophet. He's just heartbroken over the fact that the city has been destroyed and he sees the destruction and people have been taken captive, people have died, and so on and so forth. And in the midst of this song of lamentation, it says in chapter 3, verse 22, is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. Well, there, there's some great character of God right there. His, and, and Jeremiah understands this. God's mercy is always, and God's compassions will never fail. Verse 23, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. And when we are in a time of destruction, when we are in a time of defeat, when we feel like we're down, that is when we, at the, at the most critical time, need to draw upon God and His character. His mercy never changes. His love never changes. His compassions fail not. And because of that, we can trust Him. He's always the same. His love is everlasting. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your everlasting love, Your everlasting arms, Your mercy, Your grace. God, You're a God of truth, a God of compassion. You're a God of holiness. And because You're always the same, You're eternally the same, You're faithful. We can trust you. We can put our faith in you because you are always the same. You're always perfect. Father, I thank you for the time. Thank you for who you are. And we have a great week of thanksgiving as we simply think about who you are. Bless the day we go going forward. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you for your attention this morning. We'll take a few minutes off and then we'll be back for the second service.